The scripture reading for session four is taken from the book of Psalms, chapter 89, verses 46 to 52. Verse 46. How long, O Lord, will you hide yourself forever? How long will your wrath burn like fire? Remember how short my time is. For what vanity you have created all the children of men. What man can live and never see death? Who can deliver his soul from the power of Shoal? Lord, where is your steadfast love of old, which by your faithfulness you swore to David? Remember, O Lord, how your servants are mocked, and how I bear in my heart the insults of all the many nations with which your enemies mock, O Lord, with which they mock the footsteps of your anointed. Blessed be the Lord forever. Amen and Amen. This is the word of the Lord. I now pass the time to the camp speaker to bring us tonight's message. Thank you, Joshua. Right. So I will now share... Okay. Can you hear me? Everybody? Ah, the last teaching for for the camp. Uh, thank you for coming faithfully. Um, let's open with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this evening. We thank you, Lord, that this is the final session. Lord, I just want to thank you for being with us. And we pray, O oh Lord, by your Holy Spirit, Lord, would you um, help me to speak clearly and bring forth your word. And I pray for everyone, Lord, to have uh, ears to hear, and not just to hear, but to be doers of your word only. Lord, give, give us strength, and uh, give us the alertness, and we pray, Lord, for stability in the internet, so that, Lord, your word can be delivered clearly. In Jesus' name we pray, Amen. Right, everybody, welcome back, and we are now going into the final section of our uh, psalm, okay? Okay, let's... Okay, so uh, just as what uh, Joshua read just now, um, he read from verses forty six to fifty two, which are the final, uh, the end, the end part of this uh, long chapter. Okay, now just a quick overview in case any of you, uh, you know, missed any part of it, especially the beginning part. Uh, this uh, Psalm eighty nine is written by a a. a Okay, um, a wise worship leader, okay? And his wisdom was just second only to uh, Solomon. So he was actually a very wise man. He was a musician, a worship leader. His name was Ethan. And this is a psalm of lament. Now, even in times of uh, struggles and suffering, what this psalm is, was calling everyone and, the, and God's people, because this psalm is a written psalm, and it's a psalm of contemplation, uh, for to for it to be sung, so to bless the Lord and call upon His strength in time of need. So this psalm is broken up into four parts. So we have done verses one to eighteen, where he praises God for His covenant with David, praises God for who He is, His nature and His character. Then comes verses nineteen to thirty-seven, which we did last night. So he praised God for His faithfulness. God is so faithful and. I'm so thankful for God's generous uh, justice and promise to David and all his descendants. But then this morning, we see how the entire psalm shifts in its tone. Suddenly, he goes, you know, he's lamenting, lamenting, going back to God. What has happened? Well, obviously, there has been a crisis, and he is interceding for the king. He's not thinking about himself. He's, thinking, he's interceding for the king. So something has happened where the king has been badly defeated. All the enemies are mocking him, right? And he's being scorned. He's lost everything. So this is the final part, verses 46 to 52, where he doesn't stop there. He pleads with God. He asks God to remember uh, his covenant that he made to David and the ending doxology because this particular psalm is the last psalm of the third book. Well, you could say third section of the entire uh, uh, book of Psalms, 
the book of Psalms has got five sections or what we call five books and this is the last one in that third book and usually when they end the, the, the book it will always have an amen there okay and a doxology and an amen okay let's move on so let's carry on uh, to uh, Joshua has already read it so I don't have to read it again so we will move on yeah with verse 46 so like many psalmists he starts off with how long Lord how long and this is what most of us will be praying most of the time how long how long because when you're suffering you're in pain you know yeah two seconds can feel like you know two minutes and two minutes can feel like two hours so it feels really long the pain is just excruciating especially when it's from the soul how long oh lord will you hide yourself forever how long will your wrath burn like fire so he say god are you angry with us all right he cannot bear the idea that this crisis could be you know lengthened it's just too too, too terrible to, to be experienced it's just very painful so he pours himself out to god he pours his plea to god and god seems to be missing oh, go where are you hiding are you angry with us you know are you there all right okay so we, it is very likely i mean it definitely is ethan is doing that prayer of intercession he's it's he is hurting together with his king. He loves his king. He loves David. So he's likely to be praying. And the king, obviously, if he's lost everything, of course, the king would be weary as well. And that's affecting him, right? Just like when something happens to our country, we are all affected. So he wants to see that his king is vindicated, all right? And because the it's uh, he has been betrayed, everything is very unfair on his king. And he wants the kingdom to be restored because this is what God promised. You promised this, all right? So it is very likely that um, Ethan could be actually pretty old because we were saying earlier, we don't know really what was the period, what was this crisis. I'm making an assumption that it was during Absalom's time. It could be during Solomon because, you know, the, uh, Israel was already on a spiritual decline. Or it could be that he really was very, very old and it went into Rehoboam's time. All right. So that's possible as well. So... Now, you can see that he's desperate. He's, he's desperate. And uh, here, let's go and, and look at uh, verse 47. Remember how short my time is. For what vanity you have created all the children of men. Now, he is really like pouring himself out before God. And you know, it's, it's very real for us to realize. I mean, we all feel it. You know, our life on earth is so short. Right? We remember, he said, you you telling God, you know what? You've created us human beings. All right. These people that you've created, we have actually very short lives. We know that with God, 1,000 years is one day. But we know that we human beings, our lives are very short. We are like grass. You know, today here, tomorrow gone. So this is, he feels this shortness. He say, God, can you just answer me and restore this within the time I am alive? I want to see this happen. You know, and also the futility of life. You know, it's very and and sometimes you know when you think about this this psalm, I I always think that it is Absalom's time, but it could be Solomon because Solomon also wrote proverb. I mean, wrote uh, Ecclesiastes when he talks about vanity of vanities. Everything is meaningless. So you know, it's like uh, he knew Solomon well, and he obviously operated at a time you know when Solomon was really running through. Uh, probably at the end of his days, vanity of vanity. So that's why people are saying it may not actually be Absalom's time. It could be really at the end of Solomon's reign, possibly. So basically, he say, God, you've got to answer me. My life is short. It's like, it's like the way we, we pray. Oh, you know, it, it's quite funny because sometimes when I think about how we pray, you know, I started with Prayer United since GE12. Yeah, it was a GE12, I think so. So, uh, we have been praying right through. And it's like, wow. I started when? Uh, as early as 2007, 2008. So, can you imagine throughout all these, every five years, every five years, you know, and I realize I'm getting older and older and older. From 2008 until now is how many years already? And it's coming to almost, what, 15 years, right? 14, 15 years. Wow, you know, it's like I've gone through easily at least um three to four general elections praying for the nation 
there is a sense of urgency on my part. I'm like, Lord, while I'm still alive, can you do something? You know, it's taking so long, right? We feel that. We all feel that way. But we know that with God, you know, a thousand years is one day. Lord, you know, remember us, your, your, the people that you made, the, the people that you love, the, the mankind that you, you, you created. Our lives are very short. Okay, for what vanity means, it's kind of like meaningless. You have created us, you know, and I'm desperate, you know. And again, on, on, the, on, on another side, when you look at verse 47 and 48 together, we see also that urgency, uh, that cry for the, go- for the gospel's answer. But obviously, Ethan, when he wrote this, he didn't think of anything beyond David. Okay, he didn't think of that. He, he's probably, and, and, but we can see here, that it is actually very prophetic. Okay, let's move on. Let's move on. Now this is verse 48. What man can live and never see death? It's really talking about the shortness of life of a human being. We cannot run away from death. Who can deliver his soul from the power of Sheol? Then he pauses against Selah. It's very, very deep, very, very hard on him. He's asking a question, a rhetorical question. It's like a question you ask yourself, all right? So he's asking a rhetorical question, and you answer it yourself. So he's saying, you know, obviously we cannot live. Man will die. That's, uh, that's for sure. No mere man can deliver him himself out of death. He cannot save himself. Mankind cannot save himself. He's like, God, we cannot save ourselves. We're going to die. You're going to save us. So, but we also see human beings often wishing that we don't need to depend on God. This is our rebellion. Uh, we should, and this is exactly what's happening. Right? How we wish that we can live on and on and on. Oh, by the way, if you ever were to Google, yeah, you, 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 go, you go to Google uh, and then you go to the search bar and you type in Google eternal life. Right? Google eternal life. You know what you will get? You will discover that since 2017, Google, all right, the, the, the owners, uh, you could say the shareholders, they have an entire division that actually focuses on extending human life and they call it the pill for uh, eternal life. They, uh, they, they say that they will have this breakthrough in about another 10 years. So I'm like, this is a complete rebellion of men where we want to be God. Okay, so men want to tell, you know, they don't believe. Mankind doesn't want to depend on God. Mankind wants to, uh, you know, find its own destiny. And it's really scary. So when you actually discover, when I looked at Google, I said, well, I like the stock very much, but you know, these guys are going for eternal life. Goodness gracious, it's complete rebellion against the Lord God Almighty. And it's crazy. It's, it's, it's really happening before our very eyes, in our generation. You know, I'm already so old, but I can see it happening. And you see all these things happening around the world, the cultural wars, people going completely mad, you know, about um, gender, right? And I'm going like, you know, this is a madness that has got no cure because mankind wants to um, create its own truth. They they want to chart their own course. So this is where you find that mankind has always wanted to be completely independent of God. And thanks to the evil one who feeds us into our head, you know, that God doesn't want the best for us. So they believe this lie. So men believe that they can create their own truth, okay? So the thing is this, but even once the people, because this is a written psalm, it's a written song, he wants people to remember that, you know, human life is actually very short. Everybody must remember that. And that it feels so meaningless. Yeah, it does. And so but when he emphasizes on the Salah, it's like saying, He's pausing and asking everybody to just think about the meaning of life. You know, you create legacies, you create buildings, you know, you create businesses. But we, you know, especially we have a saying among the Chinese, no matter how big your business by the third generation, it's all gone. So everything is meaningless. It's all foolish. What are you trying to do? So this pause is just, you know, he's just going to, mankind, it's all vanity. All right? But only God, God remains. He, he still holds on tight to God. So Ethan doesn't realize that he is actually prophesying. Actually, God, in a sense, it's like God putting the words into his mouth. You know, he's saying all this. 
but God actually already has the answer to what he is saying. You know, man, we are going to die. You know, there's nobody we can, we cannot save ourselves. But God is saying, you know, God doesn't tell him, of course, but God already has a plan in mind that man will not die, that we will not uh, live short lives. We will be with him in eternity. So that's why we cannot understand God. We cannot like know God in, in the sense that we can understand what move he's going to make. We can't. Ethan could have, even the wisdom of Ethan could not even get to that level where he knew that God had a bigger plan. Right? But Ethan could only see the pain. So this is like happens to us. So sometimes when we are in that, 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 that situation, we can only see our pain. We can only see our suffering. We don't see God's big plan. And that's where faith comes in. Okay? So, uh, unavoidably, of course, you know, uh, that, you know the, the affliction we feel, the pain that we feel, it's like we feel it's, it's, it's more than in, enough. But God gives us enough, you know, to, for us to handle. He will never give us more than what we can handle. That's for sure. All right? Okay. So, let's go down to 49. Now, 49, he says, Lord, where is your steadfast love of all? Now, he's not going to stop. He's, he's pleading with God. After the sell-up, he pauses. Okay. Final one. Lord, where is your steadfast love of old, by which, by uh, sorry, which by your faithfulness you swore to David? Now, this is really a a very good example of how we intercede. He goes to God and he reminds God what he says. It's like us when we bring out our Bibles and we start to pray. Lord, you said this. This is your promise. Where are you? You must answer us. Now is the time. If you look at how Nehemiah prayed, you look at how Daniel prayed, you look at all the old prayers, or the powerful prayers of old, you bring them back to, to Ethan's prayer, all of them have a similar makeup. They always remind God. That's why the Word of God is so important. That's why we need to know our Bibles. We need to know that God has His promise for us. So Ethan asks a very honest, one thing beautiful about this psalm, he's honest. So Ethan asks an honest heartfelt inquiry okay he's in this crisis so he's not going to stay quiet he runs back to god he said god you you can't cast us off because you promised us you cannot renounce your covenant okay i'm reminding you where are you where is this steadfast love that you swore to your servant david okay so remember oh lord how your servants are mocked and how i bear in my heart the insults of all the many nations Ah, this is the time where you see Ethan take it personally. How I bear in my heart. So he's a servant. He has been serving David. He's also a servant of the Lord. Remember, O oh Lord, how your servants. So he's telling God, I am also your servant, Lord. Right? I am being mocked. I actually bear in my heart all these insults of all the many nations. So, okay. He could still appeal to God on his own as well. So this is the prayer from himself. I am also getting it. Now, okay, so on what God promised David, so he also comes in and prays his prayer. Okay? All right? So Ethan asks a very personal thing from God. This is from him. He's asking God, God, can you see my status now? I'm being despised. I'm actually put very lowly. And your enemies, he didn't say, you know, they're, they're our enemies. Basically, these are your enemies. Look at 51. Our enemies are actually your enemies, God. They are your enemies. Your enemies mock us. Your enemies mock the anointed one. So he reminds God, God, they are your enemies. So you can't let them win. Yeah? Okay? Be beautiful intercession. I look at it, I'm like, wow. So much to learn. So much of meat there. It's like having a wonderful meal. And you go like, oh my goodness, you know. This is, you're going to burp. Man. It's like, this is beautiful. So, yeah, we can learn from here that, you know, their enemy, David's enemies, is his enemy, is Ethan's enemy, is also God's enemy. All right? And if you look at this, you can see also so many similarities to Jesus. Jesus was also mocked. You see, the footsteps of your anointed. You can see the prophetic, the messianic elements there. You know, that Jesus himself, as he walked up the steps, yeah, all the way to Calvary, right? As he was walking through that pathway, people were mocking him, you know? People were pulling him down. He was carrying that cross. 
So you can see all that similarity. Obviously, Ethan doesn't know. But we, in this new covenant, we see so much of, of, uh, of it there. You know, how the disciples were mocked, Jesus was mocked, how they were all insulted as well. Everything is there. So, and, I, and you can see that be brought forward, even for us today. So for us today, when we pray this sort of prayer, you can see that if Jesus was insulted, if Jesus was mocked, you do you think we will not be? We will be mocked. We will be insulted. You know, there was when I was working in the bank, I had we had a lot of bosses. One of my boss openly and publicly mocked me for being a Christian. He enjoyed it. He shamed me in front of everybody. All right? He shamed me about me being a Christian. He brought me to tears. You know, nobody defended me. Of course, they, they won't defend me. They're not Christian. Why should they care? But they were so shocked that he took it very personally that I was a Christian. I was like, wow. I didn't realize that my faith can, can really upset somebody so badly. Right? But, uh, you know, I've actually uh, experienced so much of this. I don't know whether you have uh, for being a Christian. Um, there was uh, once, yeah, I always talk about passing away, because somehow when something happens in my family, when somebody passes away, God does something in my life, which I'm like, wow, this is, this is amazing. When God steps in at a time when I'm grieving, my mother passed away that day, but I had to teach because I was teaching. All the bankers were flying in from everywhere. So I cannot tell everybody, oh, my mother passed away, and then I, I cancel the class. I can't do that. People are flying in from all over Malaysia. So I told my sister, I said, hey, you handle uh, mom's funeral stuff. I, I have to finish. It's only one day. Let me clear this, and I'll come back and help you. She said, okay, fine. You leave it to me. So I went to, I went to class in this hotel, and then we were training people. There were about 60 of them inside that class. So can you imagine? My mom passed away. I'm training people. And I'm like, okay, get the job done, present, get the job done, you know. So I'm getting the job done. So by lunchtime, you can imagine my emotional state. Here I am, training, talking about finance, and here I am, my heart going, <sighs> okay. So during lunchtime, I went to the cafe. Everybody would go to the cafe there and have their lunch. So I decided to find a little corner to get something just, I couldn't really eat. So I just to get maybe a soup or you know, and a drink, just sit in a corner and just breathe a bit. Mana tower. Two persons came and sit sit next to me. Well, in a sense, they were my students in the class, so they are all bank managers. So these two came to me, and then the thing this guy went. The moment he sat down, he said, "How can an intelligent woman like you uh, be a Christian?" <laughs> you know what I did? I laughed. Here I am, probably in self pity, you know, I'm really moaning away, all right. And here comes this guy, breaches my private space, sits in front of me, having his meal, and go going. Uh, how can an intelligent woman like you be a Christian? I was like, <laughs> I said, God, immediately, you know, I was laughing in my heart. I was like, Lord, you are really amazing. I said, you are really amazing. So immediately, I realized what God was telling me. Go on, you know carry on so i looked at this guy and i and i went okay so actually i asked this theoretical question with a lot of people i said hey what would you do uh, if somebody came up to you and tell and told you and asked you hey how come an intelligent person like you uh, uh can be a christian why what what is your immediate reaction so oh, i'll be very offended many people will be offended but thank god he gave me that somehow it just came naturally i, I laughed here i am one you know in I, I, i'm actually mourning but um yeah, I laughed. I, I was like, okay. I said, well, you know. I said, you know, you're right. I said, you're right. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna, you know, fight you on that that you know, it sounds very really foolish. I said, because the Bible does say that those of us who believe in Jesus are kinda of foolish. Because uh we are believing a man that we say has resurrected and he's God. So immediately I gave him five reasons why a person would reject Christianity. I'm sure you have heard about the virgin blah, 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 blah. So the person sat sitting next to him. So I had, I had this opportunity. I was praising God. I said, God, you know, Lord God. I said, I have an opportunity. One stone, I hit two birds. I said, that person is going to hear the gospel today. Hallelujah. So I immediately told, okay, these are the things that you don't like, right? Da, 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 da. I went on that. 
these are things that you cannot accept, right? Bruh. So I said, don't, you don't have to tell me what you don't uh, disagree with. I will tell you first. I said, am I right? He said, oh, yeah, 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 you're right, you're right. Any, anything else? So I look at the lady beside him. Anything else that you, you think that Christianity is really foolish? Okay. So I said, let me tell you why I believe. So I, I did not try to give a theological class <laughs> over lunch. I just, sh I just shared from my heart. I just said, you know, uh, I, I told them, you know, really the taste, when Jesus says, come and taste, right? come and see, come and taste. I said, the real facts are that you need to have faith because you don't have faith. But, you know, the Holy Spirit gave me this because he was mocking me anyway, but I didn't take it personally. I said, this is an opportunity. I'm just going to, I'm just going to hit, you know, I'm going to hit it hard. And I was very gentle with him. I was very kind to him, but the Holy Spirit gave me an insight. He gave me, you know, and what we call a word of knowledge. I said, you attend church, don't you? And suddenly he went like, oh, yes. I said, you have a girlfriend who is a Christian and you go to church because of your girlfriend? He said, yeah. I said, oh, okay. So you went to church to look for nice girls, lah, but you don't believe what she believes, lah, but you want the girl. Lah. You know? So, and I was so shocked. He, he actually has been in three, he was, he's three years in a very big mega church. Right, so I I just went I, in the end I just told him and it actually took a whole hour by the way I didn't get to eat you know he was eating and I was actually uh, giving him the gospel and I was just telling him in the end no point that you, you know, I talk to you just like that you need to go back home and you need to confess your sin go in the room and lock the door and you tell God I said you tell God your heart that you have difficulty believing but if you're sincere if you're going to church because of a girl nothing is going to happen but if you're going to church because you really want to find the truth i said it, it will be worth your time to make that prayer and go and, and come clean with god i can tell you the guy was trembling by the time i finished and i i managed to throw you know the the gospel to two persons at one go at the end of lunch what was i how was i feeling rejoicing god is so good the lord took me away from that pain and actually showed me what he needed me to do was to focus on his kingdom gave me so much joy in my heart even though there was pain but the lord gave me that sense that i'm with you i'm watching over you i love you you carry on wonderful so this is why i say we cannot see beyond our pain but we thank god when he intervenes and that was quite some intervention you know I, I had a good laugh. By the time everything was over, I, today I can still remember that, that event. And he came to me and mocked me, and I laughed. <laughs> I just laughed. It was quite a moment. Yeah? Okay? Now, okay, then comes this part. So Ethan concludes this song, all right, with a heartfelt declaration of praise. He has been crying to God. He has been going after God. He's been reminding God. He's been pleading with God. But that doesn't stop because this is a public psalm. Right? He's telling everybody. He, this is a very hard-fought psalm. He is a hard-fought celebration of praise. No matter what, he is going to end it with praise. Okay? This is a wise man. He knows God's promises. He trusts them. He trusts God. And he's he being very honest with God. You know, God, don't go missing on me. I've got a short life and, you know, you have to do something. I want to see it happen. And yet, Ethan, because he is a worship leader, he invites all of God's people to join him in a confident, heartfelt declaration of praise. Blessed be the Lord forever. Amen and Amen. Now, some people think that verse 52 was just put in because it is the last book of that particular section well with the, this is the doxology yeah, because there is a doxology at the end of every section well some people say it was added in but many people think that you know ethan being a wise man and being one of the greatest uh you know worship leaders would have put it in himself that he would end a very powerful emotional psalm with a big benediction with a big dox, doxology he would he would just praise god because he just knows that that's why he goes back to him. Okay? 
So this comes back so much of teaching for us in our biggest pain. Never forget to bless the Lord. This is what Spurgeon says. You know, you know, he said it's quite funny how Spurgeon puts it. Ethan has taken us, you know, around the world as if he's putting he sailed around the world, took us from the very beginning, big praise, nature of God, promise. Whoa, comes back all the way down. And yeah, he says, he sails where he began, he ends where he began. Sorry, he has sailed around the world and reached port again. Let us bless God before we pray and while we pray and when we are done praying, for he always deserves it of us. That means no matter what the circumstances, because we human beings cannot see beyond what our pain is, we never stop blessing God. Blessed be the name of God. So always, blessing God should be at the tips of our tongue, should be on our lips to bless God all the time. And not let the world use the name of our Lord as a curse. We bless. Okay? We even if we cannot understand what God plans, what He wants to do, we must not distrust Him. So that comes back to the key thing about the heart of faith. Faith pleases God, and this is what we must continue to work through. That regardless of the circumstances, our faith matters to God. It means we trust that He is in control. So this is where faith meets perseverance. No matter how bad, no matter how tough, we keep going on. We keep enduring. Because we know in Hebrews 11, 6, a lot of people just read the first line, without faith it is impossible to please God. Right? But let's take a look at the next part, <clears throat> the next phrase. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who seek Him. Now, most of us have a head knowledge about God. We think that, you know, in our journey on earth, we think that we know God. But actually, we have only head knowledge. And sometimes, it is, uh, you know, it is sad, but it, it, it actually helps that when we are in pain, that we actually, basically, you're, you're, when you are in pain, there's only two ways to go about it. Either you run to God or you run away. So in that part of that pain, right, we got to, we are tested to whether we believe that God actually exists or not, right? And when you really seek after Him, that's when you will reap the rewards of your faith, okay? Just like James, yeah? James is very famous for talking about faith and works. <clears throat> so James says this, For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Our faith will continue to be tested. It is like we are going on a, how would I put it? Maybe like white water rafting. If you've got white water rafting, after one, you thought that it's over. Aye, another one. And another one. Sometimes when you're going white water rafting, you fall off the you fall off that, that kayak. Okay? You fall off. But then, you know, God will bring you back into the kayak. And then you will continue on white water rafting. But there will be a lot of rapids along the way. That's life. There are many, many rapids. Some are very steep, some are not so steep. Some parts of the, the river, you know, would be very, very smooth. But this is where all the tests come uh, as you go white water rafting. And this is similarly to what we will experience in life. There will be moments when it's going to be very difficult and we got to hang on to the Lord. And these are times when our, taste, our, our faith is tested. Now, why would we be so confident? Because our righteous king will return. Okay? Today, we are talking about justice a lot. We see a lot of injustice in the world. When you look at it, you want to tab it, you know, you're like, oh, I just cannot imagine how bad this is, right? Justice is a matter of urgent concern in our nation, whether you're in the streets of Tawau or in the halls of Putrajaya Palace, or right to the halls of Putrajaya's Palace of Justice. We all, you know, we're even a non-Christian, we all long for a just world, okay? Because this world is completely messed up. It's messed up by sin and there are effects of sin on creation as well on us too there is a big gulf about how things are and how we think they ought to be we all hope for reforms systemic right through we all hope for a utopia you know and and the, i think the nation that to me like the nations that are closest to utopia probably to me would be somewhere like japan or or Taiwan, 
very very uh, refined society everything looks good but it only looks good on the surface underneath you know they're busy paddling away we all look long for good laws we long for good leaders we long for uncorrupted judges right for the good of society we want to take take care of the common good but we know one thing and this is something that we all must must learn very quickly that there is no legislation there is no election or political appointment that can satisfy the ache of our hearts for true righteousness and justice you know sometimes we look to politicians yeah and you know it, uh, this the recent ge ge14 it really gave me such a clear sense of what god was telling us you cannot look for a resolution you cannot look for a good government because it just doesn't happen it won't happen because the world is being ruled by um men who don't know god there is no holy spirit in them so when they get power it you know they get drunk in it so the it will not yeah, even christians who end up as politicians they will they will be more partisan they will be listening to to their bosses rather than listening to what god is telling them but in our hearts as christians we long for the judge of all the earth to do what is right we long for that 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 part we long for things to really be perfect and we cannot because we know that there's sin in this world so until jesus returns we will we are going to you know still continue to uh to suffer right there will be suffering because of sin but we must remember that jesus rose from the dead all right and he is now seated in heaven so his reign actually has already begun right so his reign has already begun he's not back yet but how does he reign he reigns through us right jesus kingdom he promised will never be destroyed we can see from daniel god is in charge god is still the one who actually changes times and seasons he's the one who removes kings and sets up kings he is still in control but jesus is not back yet for the end for the end game i call it yeah so what is jesus doing now he is actually praying for us this is the work of the high priestly king as first thing he prays for us he is our majestic monarch but while he is back in heaven what are we supposed to do because jesus said we are going to do greater things so we are his church so wherever we are planted we bring god's kingdom to earth and by the power of the holy spirit god uses the church to bring that change in society so the change in society is not through a political system while we may yearn to have you know better politicians the the change in society must come from the church that is you and me that is why your role is even far more important than putrajaya you you follow what i'm saying that you the church you are god's government on earth so your job and my job is to bring forth god's righteousness god's justice through the church into the world so when you ask questions like what and what kind of social justice we do this and that that those kind of questions comes boils back down to what we understand about church church is where god's government stands and he uses the church to move out and bring these souls in so that they can be transformed only transformed hearts can transform nations right only transformed hearts can transform nations jesus work is complete all right and now it's our turn he's interceding for us so this is our job because um in heaven there's going to be no more prayer because we're going to see him face to face in heaven there's going to be no more evangelism everything that is being done is going to be done here this is our on job training here and we got to get a lot of work done and we are building God's kingdom right now because Jesus has already started his reign but it's not complete yet right how do we know that so we when we read uh, Isaiah you know uh this is chapter 42 i think okay so this is what um uh, it says behold my servant whom i uphold my chosen in whom my soul delights i have put my spirit upon him he will bring forth what justice to the nations he will bring forth all right 
He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street or a bruised reed he will not break. Our gentle king. He will not even break a bruised reed. Even a, a, a burning wick, a faintly burning wick, he will not quench. This is how gentle God is with us, how merciful he is. That he will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or discouraged till he has established justice in the earth. This is verse 1 to 4. And verse 6 goes, I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. So our king, who is God's chosen servant, Jesus himself, is going to bring about true justice in the end. Meanwhile, we on earth have to bring forth that part of the justice. We have to bring forth God, uh, as how the Holy Spirit leads us. We are on earth to bring forth that justice, which is God's benchmark, God's standard of justice. So in the end, Jesus will return. That is the promise. So when we are really down and out and things seem to be so bad, we hold on to this promise and when we pray, Jesus, I know you will return. You will return for us. You will return to judge the world. This is in Revelation 6.10. You see how, how they pray. O sovereign Lord, holy and true. How long? Same, right? How long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on earth? Yeah, it's gonna, this is war zone. Right now, there is a war zone and the evil one only wants to do one thing. Destroy God's people. And Jesus will bring forth the final justice, the true justice. He will make sure that those, all right, who, who are doing evil, the evil workers, all the foes of the kingdom, Jesus is going to get rid of every single judgment will come. That's the promise. So our glorious king is going to come back and bring forth true justice. And in the end, there will be no more tears. Meanwhile, what do we do? We do our part, right? We also have our kingdom work cut out for us. I want to share with you this story, okay? This is amazing. We're talking about politics, yeah? Now, as we know, when we look at UK, uh, we look at uh, uh, Boris Johnson resigned, the Prime Minister resigned. And what was really interesting, um, this was, I think, last week or was it two weeks ago, Sajid, ja Sajid Javid was the health minister, I think. So he says this, he said, a prayer meeting moved him to quit. I was like, oh? So my son said to me, mom, 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 prayer meeting moved him to quit. I said, what prayer meeting moved him to quit? Then I realized that the, the parliament, the British parliament, you know all the British, uh, they are, you can say 99% have already lost their faith. Okay, They are all either agnostics or atheists, and they will probably mock you if you said that you were a Christian. But I'm so surprised that you know they actually had uh, they they actually had a physical national prayer be uh, breakfast, which is the parliamentarians came together to have a uh, a prayer service. So this is what he said. I just did a quick uh, uh, cut and paste for you. It might sound a bit strange, but I was listening to the sermon by this amazing man, Reverend Les Isaac. You know he started street pastors. He told BBC. I was listening to him talking about the importance of integrity in public life and just focusing on that, I made up my mind. I went back to my office and drafted the resignation letter and went to see the Prime Minister later in the day. Now, after Sajid Javid uh, resigned, Boris Johnson no longer had support. So it was like a domino effect. So his resignation all brought about even more people to resign. So in the end, that caused Boris Johnson to actually go. Amazing. So I was actually very curious about this prayer breakfast. And I went and looked at it. So this is actually a screen grab from, the, it was telecast live, the National Prayer Breakfast. 700 people attended. All the parliamentarians were there. Amazing, isn't it? how the Holy Spirit moves. Because I know many, like my bosses uh, from 24-7, they, they, they have been praying for, for you know, Britain for a long time, especially uh, with Brexit and, and Boris Johnson and all these things and COVID as well. 
So this is less Isaac on your left hand side and these are all the people listening to him. So I decided to sit through and listen to what he said. Actually, he didn't say very much about integrity. He said more about what they were doing as Christians. So I did, and, and how they, during COVID, I think the government failed the people during COVID. What the church did, what Christ, he emphasized what Christians did during COVID for the common good. And this is, I just did a screen grab here. He started this thing called street pastors. Yeah. And these street pastors went out at night because it's pretty cold in winter as well. And there were a lot of homeless and there were a lot of people with COVID. There were a lot of people who had no food, children unfed. And they went out to listen. They said, we are here to care for you. We are here to listen to you. We are here to help you. And it is amazing. I listened to his uh, the whole thing. And he said this. He said, when he first started, he just realized that the church needed to get out. He said, we cannot do church inside. The church needs to get out because nobody's coming to church. So he decided to get people out of the church to get into the streets. Then the second thing he realized was, no, uh, what was I going to say? Uh, that, that he couldn't do it alone through his own church. It couldn't be, a, 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 because his church, no matter how big you are, you need a lot more people to walk the streets. People need help. So he got everybody together. All the pastors in that area had a meeting. And they said, okay, let's do this. So he brought the vision. They came together, right? And after that, they got volunteers to come in. So all these volunteers, they wear something like, you know, like a rela kind of, uh, you know, a jacket. And then uh, they call themselves street pastors at the back. So you see this man here? He's got a street pastor in front and a street pa big street pastor at the back. And he said, the average age of your volunteers, you wouldn't believe it, is 70 years old. Seven zero. People were coming up in the church saying, I can serve. I might be old, but my legs are good. I can just, you, your, your job is just to listen, hear, and care. Okay? So they're being trained for the job. And the oldest person is 90 years old. Also goes out to walk with them in the night, in the cold, just reaching out to people. It's amazing. And, you know, when you hear the testimonies, there was this guy that they interviewed, you know. He said, he was, so, he was like, hey, thanks, thanks, you know. And he said, thanks for saving my brother because two of them were homeless and there are a lot of drug addicts out there. And he said his brother almost killed himself, but they saved him in time. So, you know, people who are drug addicts, people who are on overdose, people who are drunk, they are there for them. And, you know, BBC, of course, all these people picked it up, all this media, but the media did not pick up to say what wonderful work you have done. The media picked it up to shame them because they were they were trying to uh, uh, convert people. You know, they were being accused of trying to convert people. So he said, are you doing evangelism? He said, no. But actually he said, we talk about Jesus only when they want to hear it. But we are there to care for them. We are there to hear their pain. So that's amazing because he's done incredible work. You know, and the churches are going around there because they decided to work together. So he calls it the Church in Action on the Street. So you can go to their website. It's just called streetpastors.org, I think. All right? So he says, Street Pastors is about Christians rolling up their sleeves and getting involved in practically responding to the problems of crime and safety. Because in, in UK, in, uh, you have a lot of ni people knifing each other, you know, using knives and killing each other very randomly. You know, you know, and all, all kinds of things are happening there. There's a lot of crime. So they have done so much good work that the parliamentarians actually invited this uh, Reverend Les Isaac to speak to them. And he just said this, all we do is do what we can, help these people, feed them, take them off the streets, give them a home. And you know, and, and I was listening here, I said, which part had the integrity part? I think because this is a health secretary. They didn't, they were, they didn't have the integrity to do good. You know, and he, I'm sure, was cut to the heart. And I, I discovered something about him. This guy is a Muslim, you know. And Im imagine he's touched by a prayer meeting. Fantastic, isn't it? You know, people, when we put our hearts to just serve God, he will give you the plan. And one thing I have learned that you need to work with other people as well. You know, because it's the, the needs of the world are just too big, too big. Okay, next, next, next. 
the cost of doing justice definitely is gonna it's not gonna be something that's gonna be easy nothing you know you can't have what i call a middle class religion jesus did say there is a cost to following him and you gotta count the cost first it's not going to be at your convenience you know the true christian the the true follower of, of christ it, it's not going to be working at his convenience it's at god's convenience god's time there's never a convenient time remember that we are the servants to jesus he's our captain so we cannot be greater than him if he's persecuted we will be persecuted always remember this when we say that we want to follow christ does it do, do, you know do, do we really mean it you know that I have been crucified with Christ, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, and the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. To be able to say that, Lord, take my life. And when you pray that kind of prayer, you don't have to worry. When you pray, God, just use me anyhow, just use me. That's one quick story. Um, just last week, um, there was uh, 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 an evangelist who came in from Australia and he shared how he started this movement called, what was it, the Rice Movement. So in Australia, the Rice Movement actually brings together Asians and they, uh, they, they share the gospel to all the Asians who are in Australia. They started in Australia. And, he, and one night, his eight-year-old son asked him, Dad, how did you start this? How did you, just tell me, how did you start this rice movement? Because this rice movement actually has been going crazy. You know, they, they started small and, and now the Lord has really blessed them in such a big way. And all he said, and he told his son, he said, uh, I just told the Lord, you know, just use me, Lord. Any way you want, just use me. And, and God used me and this is, this is the fruit of how, uh, you know, how, how, how it has actually grown. So the son just went, oh, okay, I'm going to bed now. Okay, that's it. He was wondering why the son asked. And then next morning, the son went up to him. Dad, 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 I did it. I did it. And the father was like, you did what? I did it. Did what? You know, he said, dad, eight-year-old, uh, I actually told God that you can use me anytime. Use me for your purpose. And I think, you know, can you imagine you as the father of this son and the father and the son prays that kind of prayer? You'd be like, I'm blown away. What a blessing. But it didn't stop there. It didn't stop there. The next day, he decided to go ask his friend, shall we read the Bible together? Want to read the Bible together? In school, you know, during break time. 20 minutes, the friend said, okay. So he asked the father, you know, to uh, tell the father that he's bringing, uh, he's going to have a Bible reading with his friend. Then the friend brought a friend, and it became eight, eight people. During break time, this young eight-year-old, brought the friends to listen to the Bible, and he was reading from the Bible. And one day, the father got a phone call from the mother of one of the kids. The mother is not a Christian. The mother, of course, called the father. Do you know that your son gave my son a, a Bible? So as the father said, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. Oh, no, it's okay, it's okay, it's fine, it's fine, you know. He was like, oh, okay, thank God, dodge a bullet, he said. But the son now has got a whole class, friends bringing friends, all reading the Bible. Amazing. So if you ask me that question, you know, where do we begin? Just tell God, I'm ready. Take me. Use me. God will do amazing things. It's exactly what Dia Moody says. When you say God use me, He will definitely, He loves that when you're ready for Him. Okay? Now, where do we begin? Firstly, you are running a marathon race. We are talking about faith and perseverance bringing justice into the world, bringing God's justice. God's justice begins with bringing justice back to him as well. It's a long run. It's, I mean, it's, it's a long journey. It's a, a marathon. So in order to, you know, just like even physically, if you want to build yourself up to run a marathon, you don't just start and say, okay, I'm going to run 10, 10 kilometers. You don't do that. You have to build spiritual stamina. So what I would challenge you is that in your personal life, okay, minimum one hour, one of my young people asked me, why one hour? I said, because Jesus said so. He said, could you not pray with me for one hour? <laughs> so that was my answer, you know. And, uh, and, and, and you realize why Jesus said that. He said, okay, that was to protect them from temptation because temptation was coming. Now, this one hour prayer is not for God. It's actually for ourselves. 
that we may be strong and not be tempted is to strengthen ourselves. The more we spend time in prayer, it strengthens us first. Okay? Right, spend time with God. Don't mix up your quiet time together with your prayer time. I always tell people, you know, you want to listen to God, great, because it's a conversation. You got to listen to God first before you go and tell him, bring him the, the laundry list. You got to be diligent in your in your Bible study. You need to love God's word. And this is where you find that there's so much of jewels inside there. You know, and when you discover it, you go, like, oh man, I want to eat some more. I want to enjoy it some more. You got to start somewhere. And I will tell you this. Um, don't try to do th three chapters in one day and try to clear the whole Bible through. It will just give you a skim of the Bible. Do, you know, like one chapter a day, diligently. Go deep into it. Spend another hour. You got to make time for God. You gotta, if, you're, if you want God to bless you, you want God to be serious with you, you got to start being serious with God. You got to be diligent. Put time away. If you cannot do that during a weekday because you're very busy, because you're really at work and I understand the traffic is crazy. You can turn on your podcasts, all right, and just listen to God's word. But spend a few hours longer, maybe on a Sunday, instead of going out to the mall, and spend time with God there, right? And make up for all that lost time. Just spend time, enjoy Him. Like you would enjoy the presence of your own father, just a chat, or your own children, for example. Start praying for five people in your phone book, or that you know who do not know Jesus. Pray for them first. Prepare the ground that it may be soft, because then the seed that is planted on them will be fruitful. So pray for them, and that God will use you to bring the gospel to them. Okay? Then for corporate prayer, which is very important, is for the life of the church, because you want to bring justice into the community and into the nation. The first thing is that you've got to be regular. You've got to make a commitment. Cannot be, you know, you know. Once I asked a church of uh, a thousand people, how many people turned up for their prayer meeting? A thousand people. All these mega churches, twenty people, and I'm like, okay. So that's the real quality of spirituality of the church. Is how many people actually make it a point to actually attend the corporate prayer meeting? Okay, that's a, that, that. That is the frank. I would say as an honest assessment of your church health is actually to look at the prayer meeting have it regularly and don't be afraid to go over time right because you know like you, you something oh one hour one hour only try it if the lord moves you all to pray over you know and, and intercede longer do it all right be flexible with it but you must be regular pray for opportunities first you must i would say begin everything with prayer don't do mission evangelism go for planning meeting then pray five minutes ask god to bless pray for opportunities god open up ways for us to be salt and light in the community do you want us to go out of these walls how should we go about it how, you know and we need wisdom for all these things right you don't send girls only out you know because it's, it's dangerous it's pr practical issues as well right okay so Pray with expectation means you need to pray with uh, an expectation of God answering that prayer. Many of us go to corporate prayer meetings, just pray, not expecting answered prayers when you know. Cannot be. I, you expect God to answer those prayers. So you're going to pray with expectation. So before you put a prayer item on top of it, you're going to ask yourself, what am I expecting from God? <clears throat> what do I want God to do? I want God to answer this. Okay? So what is it? Okay, be specific. All right, plan your prayer meeting properly. Pray strategically. I mean, don't pray like you know how how I really how God moved me was when my my pastor went. Let us pray for Malaysia. Lord bless Malaysia. Bless the church. Bless the people. That's it, lah. Cannot ma. You must have proper stuff. Let's like say you must pray with expectation. There must be detail in it. It must be informed prayer and pray strategically. You know, what are we, how are we going to pray towards growing the church through evangelism? What must we do, for example? Where can we go? Lord, your, your heart is for the people. You want them to be safe. What do you want us to do? Be creative. Meaning, find ways beyond just sitting down there and praying. Okay? Be creative also includes like going for prayer walks. You know, I, I can tell you this. This is very effective. Uh, very effective because... um. When 
you know, the, we went to this area where there were it was a red light area. Okay, when you walk past, the boys would tell us, you know, that one is a prostitute, that prostitute, that then that one is that. Because you know why? Every time we walk past, they will ask, hey, you girls, come, 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 come close with us. They say, why? Because others we might, might get dragged inside there. Oh, okay. So we know which one was a prostitute then. So you know what we did? We decided to pray. Pray that God will close all these things down. Do you know what happened? The police came. Everything got closed down. Then we also knew that that place also the police were very corrupted so we pray also for a cleansing you you know you may not believe it but all this is true you know the whole police department the whole you know all the officers got transferred out and then a new set came in so it's like thank you lord you know god can change an entire road an entire community because we bothered to pray over the streets okay all right like for example you're gonna walk through let's say um, uh, uh, petrol stations. Do you know that most of the baby dumping cases are actually around petrol stations? They dump babies around there inside the rubbish dump or whatever. So you pray around there that God will protect this place, that they, you know babies will not get killed. You know that God will deliver these children who are being uh, you know dumped. Uh, there'll be no infanticide. You know there's so much to pray for. You know, but the thing is, main, main thing is to remember one thing. Don't have a savior complex. Meaning, don't think that you're going to save the whole world. Do what God tells you to do. Go Do what God has given your church to do. And that's why you need to pray through. Otherwise, you're going to be all over the place. And before you know it, you're going to get very tired. All right? All burnt out, doing all kinds of things because they're nice to do. But God didn't tell you to do that. Okay? All right? Remember, when we talk about justice at the heart, we're talking about Jesus, because he is the king of justice. He is going to reign with justice. Bringing in our hearts, it starts with faith. Come back to bringing the true justice. We cannot wait, but our job is actually to bring forth God's justice into the world because the world is very unjust. We are to do justly. That means we, it has to be part of our action. All right? It's, it might sound like abstract, but it's not. You know, and when you sit down, you say, what can I do with it? What God has gifted me with? What can I help? Right? And you sit down with people, you pray together. And God will do for you what God did for this Reverend Les Isaac. He decided, okay, enough of running church. I think we're going to go out into the streets. And because we are all old people, they're not going to come after us. Probably as we, they all go out in a gang. So we're going to go to them and we're going to bring them back into the fold of God. You know, that kind of thing. Do justly, love mercy, be kind, be compassionate, love the loss, and walk humbly with God. And remember, no matter how bad things go, things are, be like Ethan. Choose to sing. Sing what? Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord before, after, morning, night, bad times, good times. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Let us bless his holy name. No matter how difficult the times are, never allow the evil one to draw you away from God. Run back to God and tell God and hold on tight to him and never let him go. And ask God to use you because he will, he will. It's a matter of whether you are willing. 